your reaction is? We had um, Travis Tiger on the show, the first part of this interview went out last week. There's a full 40 minute version of this available for you to watch on YouTube if um, you're interested in anti-doping generally. Obviously Travis Tiger was uh, one of the central characters involved in the end of the Lance Armstrong facade and the, the Armstrong lie. He's the CEO of the US Anti-Doping Agency. But there's loads of other interesting aspects to um, what USADA are doing and their relationship with um, anti-doping in America and the role that they play for uh, big boxing fights and all that kind of stuff as well. So in the background of this, there's also um, stuff coming out from Floyd Landis. He is not happy with USADA and he's not happy with Travis Tigert. Yeah, no, I don't think they have a fantastic relationship, to be quite honest with you. It's... The, the piece we're about to play kind of gets into the idea of uh, his relationship and Usada's relationship with the likes of Lance and with the likes of Landis. And of course, uh, Landis's uh, testimony, his uh, whistleblowing, was a key component. It was kind of like the Jenga piece that was pulled out and the, the, whole, the whole tower started to fall. And uh, Landis really isn't happy with how goalposts were shifted in terms of testing, in terms of uh, criteria for samples in the past that you said uh, went uh, above and beyond to actually nail this guy and to nail somebody. And, you know, ultimately he was uh, a, a doper and there's kind of a, a moral grey area here as to should he be going out of your way and be as ruthless as possible to pop all the dopers he possibly can. All right, so let's pick it up here. This is um, uh, Travis Tiger talking about his role in the US Postal case, his relationship with Armstrong and his thoughts on Floyd Landis. Have a look. Hey, Travis, you've had a, a very interesting career in terms of dealing with cheaters and chasing up cheaters, and you talk about the cheaters here in the current situation, that when they potentially reach justice, I often wonder what you would do in that situation. Would you be open to the idea of cheaters coming on board to try and help the quest for clean sport a little bit more? Because after all, they have been inside the camp of one of the most high-powered state-sponsored doping regimes, allegedly, that we've ever seen. They know a thing or two on how to cheat. They could be of help, surely. Without question, and, and our our approach, um, you know, the the U.S. Sur Postal Services case, our cycling investigation here in the U.S. Mm. that that was the exact strategy we used from an investigative standpoint was to give every athlete and and make no mistake, we gave even Lance Armstrong the opportunity to come in to sit down to be truthful because the athletes themselves, to some extent, are being abused. Can you imagine being an athlete in Russia and to some extent in the in the Peloton in the late 90s where the rules were you had to cheat to be effective and that the those in the system, the, the team doctors, the coaches, um, the sport organizations, they turned a blind eye to it. That's not much of a choice for athletes. We saw that in our cycling investigation T today with the Russia situation. Look, it's a state. They're using these athletes and abusing these athletes by requiring them to take these drugs in order to represent their country and go from a seventh place finish in 2010 to a first place finish in, in, in Sochi. That's all for that national pride and that national power. So, so they're just being you know, abused as well. So absolutely, we were willing to give, in our case, and would in this one, an opportunity for those on, in the trenches who are being preyed upon by others to, to come forward, be truthful, Give us whatever evidence you have and let's clean up this system so that we know athletes in the future aren't going to be subjected to the kind of abuse or lack of choice that we saw in cycling, for example, and that clean athletes actually can have an opportunity to compete and win the right way. Sure, and like the, the U.S. Postal example is a fantastic one because I guess from your standpoint now, you can tell us what actually happens after we find out who the bad guys are and after we find out what sort of justice can be meted out. Like, let's take Lance Armstrong, for example. And obviously, there's a fascination around it, but there's a practicality to talking about this in this context as well, Travis, as you'd appreciate. So, could I just ask first up, when was the last time you spoke to Lance Armstrong? Oh, it's been, I don't know, a few... Um Probably, probably a few months. You know, maybe back March, April time period, if uh, if memory serves me. Right. And what was the nature of the discussion? Was it to do with the idea of him perhaps helping out with the the fight for clean sport, or was it a catch up, or, or or what? What was the nature? Yeah, it was just you know just just about what the the the, the terms of the sanction, what it what it means, what events he may or may not be able to to compete against or be a part of. Um, and and look, we're we're always hopeful. That whether it's him or anyone else who's been, you know, caught and sanctioned, that they come forward and are truthful and, and try to right their wrongs and, you know, apologize to the people that they've harmed in the way. 
and do everything within their authority going forward to, you know, not continue to make excuses, but accept responsibility and understand the rules are the rules and ought to be applied fairly and evenly, but, yeah. but try to help the system moving forward in, in any way that they possibly can and, and truly be sorry for, you know, not just being caught and sanctioned, but, but sorry for the, the action and, and, and try to make the system better so that athletes today actually have a choice, not just to join the dopers, even if they think the entire culture is doping, but to do what takes a little courage mm. at the time and, and some bravery. And you look at Yulia by, uh, Stepanov and Vitaly Stepanov, you know, that's what they did. They do you think Lance Armstrong has that same potential? Yeah, I, I, think every, I think every athlete that's ever, you know, gone through um, uh, that situation has that same potential. Now, that may not mean there's a reduction in sanction. You know, that opportunity was given back in the summer of 2012 and several months after that as well. But um, so that's a different question. But but certainly in the eyes of, you know, forgiveness and redemption and being accepted back into the sporting community, not necessarily competing because the sanction is the sanction. Um, you know, we, we wish the best for, for every athlete that finds themselves in that situation. And we always encourage athletes to, you know, take responsibility, try to right the wrongs that were committed and move forward in a productive way so that clean athletes of this generation and future generations can, you know, have have real choice yeah. uh, when it comes time to competing the right way. But it must be a, a tricky one, though, when you think about it. I'm sure you've thought about it quite a lot. If Lance Armstrong came to you in the morning and says, listen, Travis, I want to help out with the fight for clean sport. Do you believe him? I mean, Betsy Andreu described him as a remorseless, pathological liar. Look, I, I think there's a, a long way from... Um, you know, being able to embrace, um, given where it's at, and, and and it'll take a lot. But I'm, but I'm, but I'm overly hopeful. You know, that everyone that finds themselves in that situation can, can, can come to terms with the with what's occurred, um, and and try to move forward for the good. I, I see the the good in everyone, and look, I would like nothing better than, um, you know, an athlete, whether it's Lance Strong, Armstrong or any other that's been caught. Um, doping and cheating at the levels that they were to to, to come forward and, and actually you know try to right the wrongs in a real way and and move forward that's productive for not only themselves I think um, that's not my call but I certainly see it that way but but for the sport in general when you look back on your work particularly in the U.S. Postal case do you think that there was a certain aggression there a robust nature to your investigation that probably was required at the time? No, look, we just we just did our job. <laughs> you know, we, we took an oath to apply the facts um, to the rules, to search for the truth. And, and that's absolutely what we did in that case. And it's what we do and had done prior to that. You know, whether it was Balco, dealing with Marion Jones or mm. Tim Montgomery or, you know, some, some of the global icons who cheated, made the unfortunate decision to, to break the rules at that time. I mean, that's our job, right, is to sure. pursue the evidence to exonerate the innocent just as as hard as we do to convict the guilty and and look th this case once the floodgates opened um and the first few witnesses came forward you know the the truth was overwhelming and it you know frankly you know was was like a tidal wave of truth and and we simply applied that those facts to to the rules and came out where we did and and made you know mistake as i mentioned earlier we gave you know, Armstrong, the opportunity to come in and, 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 and face the truth also and be part of the opportunity to clean up the Peloton. And, and I think there was a missed opportunity there for the effort, quite frankly, while a lot of good, I think, came from the investigation. The CERC was established. A new president um, came in on a clean sport platform. The Independent Cycling Foundation to separate the Fox Guard and the Hen House was set up. Um, you know, a lot more could have happened, I think, earlier in the event that, that Armstrong would have chosen to, to take our offer and come in and, and be part of the solution. And, of course, I'm, I'm sorry that he didn't do that. Yeah, I'm sure. And I'm, I'm sure it was a particularly difficult situation. It's just really interesting when you read about some of the other writers. And you, you talk about the flood of information. I think, like, we'd all uh, agree that Floyd Landis and his admissions were one of those moments that created this, this flood moment. And it, it's really interesting reading some of Floyd Landis, like speaking uh, to Paul Kimmage last year. Um, like, he, he says uh, he still resents USADA for some of the things that they did. He, he talks about uh, the 2006 and the A sample and the B sample. And he's, he talks about 
this B sample, which was negative at the UCLA lab, and they just re retroactively changed the positive criteria. You can't do that, and that just made me want to fight more. In hindsight, I should have stepped back and said, this isn't really worth it because I'm effed anyway, but I had to fight. It kept me alive. Is that true, Travis? Listen, I mean, he fought. There's no doubt about that. But but no, look, the, he had an 11 to 1 TE ratio and a positive CIR that would have been positive, um, you, you know, was was positive in that that laboratory, as was 11 to 1. So, so there was no retroactive changing of the criteria? No, no. Okay. And, and, and all of that, so that's not the truth. Yeah, you know, yeah I, I'm not sure what he's referring to there, but what I can tell you is there was <laughs> two separate hearings. I think the first hearing was about 11 days, you know, dozens of witnesses, laboratory legal experts, um, you know, uh, 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 the, the lengthiest live hearing in front of independent judges that we've ever had. It was all streamed on the Internet. Media was present during the room, which is totally fine. And, and we welcome that because it was an opportunity to let the truth be known. Um, they then and they and that, you know, found him to have committed the violation. They then appealed that decision. But look, what what's unfortunate is, again, a lot more good could have been done is when the positive test and the doping was first revealed, if, if he would have come forward. And, and look, I understand that he's uh, upset and resentful. You know, when you get caught doing something and are held accountable, yeah, you it's not, it's not uh, you know, a pleasant day necessarily. You lose a lot, but yeah. let's, let's make no mistake, that comes back to the decision that those athletes make to begin with to cheat sport. And they went and, and let's, you know, the, the Peloton went to great lengths at that time, particularly the postal services, to use drugs, blood transfusions, um, a sophisticated network to avoid testing, to ensure they tested negative at every turn. Um, so it's a little hard now to say, well, I shouldn't be held accountable. When they knew it was against the rules, they, they took a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of money um, to try to break the rules, and and then the, they got caught. I mean, it's it's really as simple as that. I think. Yeah. So like, time. Like I'm not. I'm not. I'm not justifying at all what uh, Fortinand said. I mean, like he he is ultimately a cheater. It's just very interesting. I find looking at the idea that he was broke and he he wanted to fight this, and he, he like makes the point that you guys weren't even trying to catch people for the things that we were doing. He says, so I'm going to fight, and I'm going to fight like nobody has ever fought. Uh, he says he wasn't suicidal, but he didn't really care if he lived. I mean, he went to extraordinary lengths because he felt that USADA had shifted the goalpost dramatically to try and catch him out. And do you know what, Travis? Maybe that is the way to go. Maybe that is how you, you catch cheaters. I'm not sure because the anti-doping process sometimes kind of falls through some of these loopholes. Yeah, listen, I, I, you know, I, I, I haven't read what you're referring to that Floyd said. What I can tell you is our job was nothing more ever than a search for the truth. And, you know, I, I would encourage every athlete, if they find themselves in that situation, you know, don't, don't lie and don't, you know, deny, but, and, and you know, go on a, a public tour raising money from folks supporting what you know to be a lie and not the truth. But sit down. And if you think there's a place where the goalposts are being moved, we can talk through that and show you that that's not the case. We, we have no interest in that. Our, our job is to simply what are the rules and are we going to enforce the rules to protect clean athletes? Um, and, 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 and that's the decision I would hope any athlete that ultimately does cheat, that gets caught, would come in and, and sit down and do that. But, but frankly, I would hope athletes stand up before they decide to cheat. And, sure. and that takes a lot of courage and a lot of bravery. Few athletes have done it. We saw Julius Stepanov do it. Um, and that's what I would encourage athletes, you know, back during the, the dark days of the Peloton, as well as any athlete today that might find themselves in that situation. There, there are organizations out there, and, and, and we're not perfect. No doubt about that. We're striving every day to be the best we possibly can be. But we're, we're, we're pushing hard to give athletes an independent opportunity when they're confronted with a dangerous situation, whether it's doping or otherwise, to come forward and, and, and have someone that supports them get yeah. to the bottom of it and protect their right to equal play and fair play. Of course. Like, do you think cycling is a much cleaner sport than it was during the U.S. Postal days? Because uh, it seems that, like, I, I don't know what, what Floyd or Lance are thinking, but I'm sure they're thinking to themselves, well, cycling is just as dirty now as it was back then, and we were the guys who got caught, and we got caught spectacularly. Yeah, look, I, I think it's I, I think system changes have happened, right? I mean, I mentioned the new president, the Independent Cycling Foundation, the CERC. You know, we pushed the CERC to have um, complete amnesty 
for athletes that came in, you know, was the entire dirty Peloton at that time exposed and held accountable? I don't, I don't, no, nobody thinks so. Is the Peloton just as dirty now, uh, in your view? No, listen, I, I think, I think the bias has changed because of those system changes, because of the deterrent value that's been shown through organizations willing to enforce the rules, no matter so how it, big it is cleaner, small, you think? I, I think the bias has absolutely changed. Okay. In favor of clean athletes. I think you can I think you can win today. Now, does that mean it's athletes aren't trying to gain an advantage? Absolutely not. I mean, I think that's human nature. That's the difficulty of the fight we're in. But I, I think athletes now know that they can win the right way and that if they see a Peloton that's becoming dirty, they have outlets to go to to ensure that they're right to compete clean is being upheld. Well, why, why has that happened? Why is it easier for a clean athlete to win now? Do you think that your investigation has such a lasting impact in the peloton that attitudes have changed? Because to me, it seems the incentive is still there, that there still isn't a huge amount of proof that testing is actually working. And therefore, if there's a chance you might get away with it, you're probably going to do it at, at those high stakes, no? Well, you should, you should look at the evidence from our reason to se- decision um, that was published in 20. 20- 12, and you can see the affidavits by all the writers and, and even Armstrong's own um, Oprah interview. He acknowledged that the athlete biological passport that was implemented for UCI pro peloton athletes wasn't in, implemented until about 2007, 2008, if memory serves me. But once that was put in place, so the testing, once independent organizations came in, NATOs like us, like others around the world, to a certain extent, the World Anti-Doping Agency, we've talked about some of their you know, challenges at this moment, but but make no mistake, since the dark days of the Peloton in the late 90s, when UCI was running it under their rules, it's an entirely different situation. And the likelihood of, of winning clean, I think as high as it's ever been, the tests are way better than they've ever been. And even in the rider's own admission, um, the Athlete Biological Passport has created an environment where you know, the hardcore game-changing doping of the past, the blood transfusions that a few athletes at the time had access to, as the evidence in the Bruneo recent decision will show you, mm. um, is, is, I think, is, I think is, is, is gone. Now, yeah, the, we've got to be vigilant to, to maintain it, um, but I think the, the system, the, the culture has shifted dramatically since, since those days. Well, and the, and the in Brunel, part, because Brunel. you have independent groups who are committed to, to fixing it and not sort of the five star in the hen house. I mean, remember Armstrong had a positive test in 1999. Um, the whole thing could have stopped then, but the UCI found an excuse for him to, sure. to walk around it. Like that, that, that was that, like, obviously that was a, a pretty spectacular failing on the, on the sports part at the time. Like the, the Brunel one, I'm glad you brought it up. It's a really interesting one because uh, especially what you said afterwards, you said it's a, another powerful example that playing by the rules matters and doping is never justified and always inexcusable, which is why... Personally, I have the, this uh, this cynicism about the Tour de France because of the former dopers that are still riding in the Tour and because of the former dopers that are still involved in teams and team management and things like that. Should they not all just be gotten rid of if they really wanted to change the, the, the view and uh, the, the, the culture in the Tour de France, perhaps? Look, we, it, it goes back to what I said earlier about the, the day of disappointment when Armstrong, instead of coming in and sitting down and, and using his influence within the sport to help set it on an entirely new platform, you know, decided to, to contest and sue and all that sort of stuff, try to take us down. Um, I, I think, yeah, we, we pushed not only through our investigation, but then also in our interactions with the CERC, the Cycling Independent, um, you know, investigation, to, to give the riders immunity, amnesty, if you want to call it that, so that they all can come in. And we can clean out the system, the doctors, the t- team directors, the team owners, anyone in the sport who, who knew or was complicit in allowing this culture to exist. Because if we didn't dismantle the system, just athletes would continue to come into it. And the culture, the system would put a lot of pressure would, for them to dope, would turn a blind eye when they did dope, like mm. we saw in 99 with the Armstrong positive test. And, and so that was always our goal. And, and look, I don't, that, that wasn't achieved um, in, the, in the fullest for reasons beyond our control. Unfortunately, we would have loved for that to absolutely have happened. Does that mean it's like it was in the 90s? I, I, think, I think not. Does yeah. it mean we have to continue to give clean athletes support and a system that is going to have their back? A- absolutely. It's too important to, to go the other way.